You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Carol Goodman. Flesh, Blood, Steel, the new book from David Allen Jones. 16-year-old Jake Harris wakes up after a horrific car accident to find 13 years have come and gone. He is 29 years old, a cyborg, and one of the world's most feared assassins. Horrified by the things he's done, things he can't remember, Jake vows never to kill again. Unfortunately, the company that owns Jake has other plans. They're not about to lose their top hitman to the errant memories of his teenage self. When Jake manages to escape them, they launch a worldwide manhunt that ranges from a near-future New York City to Paris. Desperate to remain himself, Jake joins a rebel faction dedicated to wresting control of the world's governments from the hands of militarized corporations. Using his enhanced body and perceptions, he is able to aid them in their fight. But Jake doesn't realize the rebels have their own plans for him, ones that involve unleashing his unique talents on their enemies. Faced with a dark past he can't recall and uncertain whom he should trust, Jake must come to terms with the sinister choices that molded him into the man he became. The question is, can he avoid doing it all again? Assassins aren't born, they're programmed. Flesh, Blood, Steel by David Allen Jones. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am really excited to have Linda Fairstein on the show with me today. Linda, uh, when you're hearing this uh, show, her 20th book in the acclaimed Alexandra Cooper series is out everywhere. It's called Blood Oath. Uh, this book looks fantastic, and it reads even better. Uh, welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you, Hank, for having me. Really look forward to talking with you. Oh, I'm excited to have you. Uh, I am a huge fan of, uh, of thrillers and, and mysteries, and uh, this book just grabbed me uh, right from from the cover. But, you know, when I dug in, uh, you know, this was one of the books that, that made me lose sleep at night, so I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Thanks. <laughs> uh, before we get into talking about all that good stuff, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Teller. My first memory uh, takes me to about fourth grade. Um, I've always loved books. My mother used to take me to libraries on Saturday, and uh, I could have three new, in those days, limited to three, three new ones. Those great librarians, when you bring them back, would say, what did you like? Well, maybe, dear, you'd like this one. Um, by fourth grade, I was just keenly fixed on Nancy Drew, and I loved everything about um, the idea of storytelling. Uh, and so I dated to that time because my mother, who was not a hoarder, actually saved the first story that I wrote um, for school. And in the little construction paper, yellow cover, and my drawings of the, the kids, the title is The Secret of Apple Tree Farm. And when my mother died, we found among her important papers this, this first short, short story, and uh, it was clearly from that point on that, I, that it gave me great pleasure to be a storyteller. I love hearing about those early influences, and, and I was going to ask you if uh, uh, you know what what series really captivated you, and I think Nancy Drew is um, is a perfect thing. But it's so funny how these early influences stick with us throughout life and and tend to affect the kinds of stories we tell. Um, uh, Nancy, I, I can't tell you how many people have been on the other end uh, of this podcast and have cited Nancy Drew. That was such a phenomenal uh, series, and I, I wonder if we can if we could duplicate that for uh, a new generation of readers. Well, I have to say that Nancy Drew, I always credit with giving giving me two careers. I mean, the sleuthing uh, in real life, my career as a prosecutor, I'm sure 
was in part inspired by Nancy and her friends solving all the crimes in River Heights. And my, um, obviously, storytelling career, I really date to loving those stories and coming back to continuing characters. I think writing a series is so different than writing standalones. And again, that was, oh, what a comfort when Nancy was back with Bess and George and Ned Nickerson. So I actually, to divert from Blood Oath, wrote a, a trilogy of books my homage to Nancy Drew that are for eight to 12 year olds um, with a character named Devlin Quick, who's a 12 year old detective. And I credit, I mean, that's, I wrote that series because of the pleasure Nancy Drew gave me at that age. I love that. I love that. Um, you said that your mom saved the, that first story that you did in you know, the, the little bound booklet. Um, did, did your mom bring that up to you uh, as you grew up and, and remind you of that? Um, uh, I, I love when, when adults give some sort of encouragement to a kid uh, because, you know, as writers, we hang on to those things in those dark, lonely writer times. Uh, <laughs> did, <right>. did, <laughs> there are a lot of those. Thank there you. There are. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting because my mother, while well, she enjoyed that one and brought up often that I had started writing in elementary school and, and she would say somewhere I have the first story you wrote, um, but it didn't surface right away. It was my father uh, from whom I got this gene. My mother really did not enjoy reading adult mysteries. She didn't like to be frightened. She didn't like to read about murder. She, uh, she loved biography and history and some literary fiction, but she she read my books, I'm laughing, but sort of grudgingly because she heard my voice as Alex Cooper. And it was like, did you really go out in the middle of the night like that? Did you really go see the body? Uh, she, she couldn't separate them. My father, on the other hand, um, I would say I went from Nancy Drew to Poe and, and Conan Doyle. And for me, Conan Doyle and The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes was life-altering. I, I still think it's the best series of stories ever told for the storytelling and the the use of intelligent deduction as the means of solving solving the crime. And it's my father who then, through my adolescent young adult life, put um, Le Carre, he loves spy thrillers. He put like Le Carre in my hands. He put so many uh, books in the genre of either thriller or murder mystery into my hands that that he gets that credit. <laughs> and my mother stays with the, the more cheerful Nancy Drew period. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Um, yeah, I used to be one of those people that, that my mother loved uh, gritty mysteries, and 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 uh, I, I was kind of a I was kind of a nervous kid when I was little, and and I, I stayed away from stuff like that. But the older I got, um, you know, those kinds of stories helped me. Uh, kind of deal with my outlook on the world I think um, it's something about facing those fears and, and doing it in a way uh, with characters that we love and trust um, what do you think about um, the types of stories you tell and and how do you think uh, they help us to, uh, to to look at the darkness of the world and maybe still find some hope Really good question. When I started prosecuting, this is ancient history, Hank, it was 1972, and I was 25 years old, right out of law school, and there were very few women, as there were in many professions, in the criminal law, in the courtroom. Uh, and when I would tell people, my family, my closest friends at a dinner party or holiday party, what I was doing, it seemed so dark. People couldn't understand why I stayed there and why it gave me pleasure or satisfaction to, to be there. And for me, it was taking a very ugly world and being able for the first time, because we began in the 70s to change our laws, for the first time we were getting survivors, uh, many of them women, into the courtroom and being able to offer them a resolution and a good one, being able to let them triumph. Uh, and that's very much what I set out to do in my books. I wanted them, I wanted the reader to trust Alex Cooper 
there are two detectives, as you know, who, who work closely with her, Mike Chapman, who's homicide because there's a murder in every book, and Mercer Wallace, who, who is um, special victims. And they're like, to me, the three musketeers. Um, they, they each have different talents. They cover each other's back. I mean, I think that's the primary thing if they were... If they were swordsmen in revolutionary France, they would be being sure that each of the other was going to come out of this, okay? And I want the reader to be comforted knowing that something bad has happened to somebody, but here is this trio of, of people with heart and soul and good brains and experience who are going to try to get to the right place uh, and restore dignity to the survivor and restore justice to kind of the community you you worked as a prosecutor uh like you like you said um not just any crimes but some really vicious horrific uh heart-wrenching crimes uh were Mm -hmm. were kind of your specialty right yes (laughs) yes uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of people. I'll, I'll use this analogy. A lot of people love animals, uh, but it takes a special person to be a veterinarian because not only do you get to see cute puppies and kittens, um, sometimes you have to deal with with tragedy and yeah. and help families deal with that and and help try to heal uh, animals. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't always work out that way, and you have to take the good with the bad um, when you're working with with people in situations like in the sex crimes unit where you did, um, how do you keep uh, a positive outlook and, uh, you know, how do you deal with the kinds of tragedy that you see and still keep your faith in humanity? That's a good bundle of questions wrapped yeah, I know. up in I'm, one. I'm sorry. I asked like 18 <laughs> at a time. Good. I'm sorry. No, that's good. Uh, so I came to it, to the work, I, not because I wanted to do it. There was no special victims unit anywhere in America when I started doing the work. And the DA I worked for recognized that um, this had to change and this area of law was beginning to change. And this, Hank, is is a dozen years before DNA was ever dreamed of being used forensically. So we just knew that the laws were bad, bad, that these crimes were happening with alarming frequency and that nobody had been able to get past the archaic laws that we had. So uh, I would never have come out of law school as many young women do today and say, this is the work I want to do because it seemed so hopeless at the time. And there, there were no specialized agencies to do it. Uh, Instead, when the DA decided to do it because I was one of only a handful of women there he asked me to take over the unit. And my first answer was no, um, that I didn't want a steady diet of a crime that I thought was going to be so depressing to handle. And I got about two steps past the DA's office having delivered my no thank you when uh, his chief assistant stopped me and said, and of course, this is the early 70s. It was the days of the Godfather movie. And he said, you know, this was not an offer you could refuse. The DA is asking you to do something and there's no no to that answer. You say yes and you do it for a couple of years and he'll let you do whatever you want. And I turned right around and went back in and said, of course, I'll do this work. Uh, And it was very difficult at the beginning. And I would say, literally, I had strengths that I had been given, I had grown up with in my family. Um, And I think had I not had those strengths, had I not been uh, by nature an optimist, I I would have failed at that job. It was also a point in time where we were beginning to be able to change laws, where I could get the attention of the DA and say, this just isn't fair. You have to go to the state capitol and fight for this. So uh, those things all just kind of wrapped into one place and time, along with, I would say, my nature, which was um, pretty upbeat. And to be able to see for the first time that we could take a survivor and get her to the finish line intact, emotionally intact, and occasionally get justice for her, that's what kept me there. That's what kept me doing the work. 
and what amazing work it is uh hats off to you and and everyone who ah. uh who's in the in the trenches every day uh that, that's such incredible work um what what brings you to fiction so it goes back to my childhood dream and after my fourth grade story, certainly junior high school, high school, look at the yearbooks, or please don't look at the yearbooks, but they say uh, right under that goofy kind of picture, um, ambition, I want to be a writer. And my father, whom I adored and who loved literature and books and thrillers in particular, used to say to me, you know, you have nothing to write about. You better get a career. Um, And so... I settled on law school because my other interest was public service. Uh, but I, I never gave up the dream of writing. And that's literally the way it happened eventually. Um, well, first I was asked, uh, I started in 72, as I mentioned. In 90, about 1990, a publisher went to the DA and said, there have been so many changes. Would you allow Linda to write a book about the legislative reforms and, and what you've done? And that book became Sexual Violence, which was my first work, and it was a nonfiction book. Uh, And then I went back to the DA and back to the Conflict of Interest Board of the City of New York and said, now that I've done that, how about crime fiction? That's what I've always wanted to do. Do I need permission of the city? And the, the ethics commissioner said, lady, everybody thinks they can write a book. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You don't need permission. Just, you know, you can't do it on city time. You have to do it, you know, early in the morning, late at night, weekends, whatever. Uh, So I'm a morning writer and I used to get up two hours ahead of time in the dark and start to write for as long as I could before, before going down to the DA's office. But it was just... A, I just wanted the fulfillment of trying to write a book or two, and that's that's how it started. I love crime fiction, and I love series fiction. Again, starting with Nancy Drew, going on to Sherlock Holmes, and then moving on to you know Lee Child and Lisa Scottellini and Lisa Gardner and um, the uh, the my my colleagues, my partners in crime who do it so well today. And and what fantastic partners in crime to be lumped in with, right? Um, yeah, um, and and now we find ourselves at the twentieth, uh, you know, coop book, Blood Oath, uh, plus the the books that you did for young readers, um, Linda. You you have all of this real world. Um, experience that that you can draw upon and uh you know writers we we hate to be asked the question where do you get ideas from because they're everywhere um and uh but you know there is a difference between random story ideas and that certain inspired idea the one that floats a little higher than the rest and and that you can look at and see endless possibilities with um how do how do story ideas usually come to you? Is it is it a, a character? Is it someone in trouble? Is it a, a premise? A, a certain plot device you'd like to use? How, how does the, the the germ of it begin with each book? This is such a wise question and such a writer's question, Hank. And I thank you for asking it. Uh, there's usually a kernel, and sometimes it's it is sometimes character, sometimes it's motive in. All of my books, I've never written about an actual case of mine from beginning to end. I much prefer to to take an idea, whether from a newspaper or a case, and then build my own fictional narrative around it. This one, actually, um, not a spoiler, but the story involves Lucy, a 24-year-old woman who uh, claims to be the victim of a crime 10 years earlier with absolutely no evidence, no reporting at the time. And the person she accuses has become a powerful individual, publicly powerful individual. Uh, And will she take him on and could she successfully take him on and would Alex be a part of that? This story, and you were the first person interviewed to ask this, actually came to be because um, the, the person who is the villain in this book is drawn loosely, but but unquestionably from a man I know who uh, became a very prominent public figure and had done something 
horrible as a young adult prosecutor. Uh, and I, it, it was he wasn't in my jurisdiction, uh, but he was really well known and had a national reputation. And I was haunted three years ago when I read his story and tried to imagine how he had derailed the life of the young woman he abused. And so I tell my own story, but uh, there's no question that Blood Oath comes from um, the the tragedy of this young woman's life really brutally interrupted by uh, a man who went on to great prominence. It, you're... Um the, the time that you spent uh, prosecuting, and, and you, you talked earlier about how uh, when you began, it was maybe a dozen years before DNA evidence was uh, was accessible, and and, uh, and you were able to use those tools. Um, I, I assume you're not working uh, there any longer? I don't work at the DA's office, but I'm still a lawyer, and I, I train there once or twice a year, and I uh, consult not with them, but uh, around the country on other cases – if people need that kind of help and know that I do it, they call on me. I'm happy does, to do that. Does staying connected that way help you to um, stay up and sharp on current technologies and current ways of thinking? And, and do you do you feel like staying connected there? Uh, because a lot of writers, uh, you know, do that. They, they work in an area, start writing about uh, writing about it, retire. Um and I think you can tell in some writers' work that they're not staying connected. Uh, but but you stay on the cutting edge. Does does that help you to to stay up and current on things? Yes, I think uh, – good point. I think as long as Alex has the real job, I've got to stay in that world. There are changes in forensics, as you know, every few months. Um, all of the electronic means of surveillance and – uh, CCTV cameras on street corners uh, really have changed the way cases are investigated and prosecuted. So uh, I stay very current. It's most of the uh, people in the special victims unit, domestic violence unit, in the DA's office, many of the administrators are what I call my team. Uh, they trained with me, worked with me, worked shoulder to shoulder with me. And um, they're also great Great readers of crime fiction. So this week, uh, when we celebrate the launch of Blood Oath, um, they're the first group of people that I, um, my husband and I always have a dinner celebrating them uh, with the new book because uh, they're my go-to people when I want to know what's new forensically and anybody had a really interesting character or come through or a, a new motive on a case that might work for me. So uh, I, I really feel the need to stay connected. Alex is an, an amateur sleuth, as many, as you know, as many sleuths in, in this genre are. So she's got to know what's going on. Right. Uh, Linda, one of the things I love about series fiction uh, is that not only do you get familiar with a character, but a lot of times you get familiar with certain surroundings. And uh, New York is almost a character in your books and in the way that it is, it's very familiar and you take us to places that I believe are, are real places. And I almost feel like from reading your books, I could take a restaurant tour of New York City. Uh, are, are these real places and and are what do you look for in 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 details and, and things like that to help immerse us into this place that that you know most of us in the country or around the world are, are not as intimately familiar with as you are sure well two things the light one i'll talk about first is the restaurants and from the beginning of this series i always figured alex and her pals have to eat somewhere so why in this city of great restaurants and food knowledge, why would I make up places? Um, and instead, I've just always included uh, places where the restaurant owners and the waiters and bartenders are good to me. So I've put them in the books. And they're an Italian restaurant called Promola, which has all of my book jackets on the wall. You'd think I was part owner. Uh, <laughs> and a steakhouse named Patroon. I've got a deli and a pizza place and a burger and salad place. And um, it's just fun for me to use the real place. 
Uh, of course, many New Yorkers know these places, but the sweet thing is a lot of times when my readers come to New York, they'll actually go to the place um, and have a picture taken and send me the picture. And um, I try to make sure we buy them a drink wherever they go. Um, so so that's fun. And then, as you may know, um, I don't like books that are just in this genre that are just thriller, action, shootouts, car chases. I like to learn something in a book. So I've set all my books in some New York City landmark, uh, trying to, to um, make it historical uh, in a way, um, but th- so that you learn something. And, I, and for me, the, the moment that made me go there was in the 1980s as a young prosecutor. There literally was a murder in the Metropolitan Opera House, uh, during a performance, a violinist went backstage between acts to meet a guest conductor and was waylaid by an employee she did not know um, who abducted her by force and, and killed her. And um, the idea that there were 4,000 people in their seats in what is the cultural center of New York City just staggered me. And so... Um, All of these places that seem so benign, the New York Public Library, our great museums, uh, Governor's Island, tourist sites, there's – you scratch the surface and there's often a dark underbelly. And that's what I love to do, to find a place in New York that just makes the story a little richer for being a real location and not a street corner or subway station stop. Right. Um, you mentioned earlier, Linda, that uh, how the the technology of the job uh, has changed o- over the years and, and up to a month to month basis in, in some cases. Um, how has the job of being a writer changed in the time that you've been doing this? And and do the oh. have the tools evolved? Um, do, do, has your writing process changed in the midst of all of this? Wow, such good questions. So certainly the tools. Uh, When I started writing in 1990, my nonfiction book, um, I don't think in the office we even had computers, city government being kind of the last to get them. And I love the romantic image of writing longhand. I have pictures of myself uh, that my husband took at the time where I'm sitting with my uh, yellow legal pad writing the first chapters of the book. And somewhere early in there, I met my first computer and there was no going back. Uh, so so that's obviously, for me, the biggest change. And I do write on a computer um, and I'm totally inept at things even as simple as cutting and pasting. But, but I do all my writing and editing on a computer. And, I mean, other changes. So for me, the process is pretty much the same. I think I'm more, um, I'm more intense about it. I'm more comfortable now. Um, imagine, as you know, how tentative you are writing your first and second and third books. You know, can I do this again? Maybe it was beginner's luck the first time. Um, so I have more confidence when I sit down uh, to write. Then I would go to you know, what the internet has done to change things for better and worse. Uh, I can do so much research on the internet, although my first choice is always to go to a place for the smell and the feel of something that you can describe much better that way. And secondly, because there's so much misinformation on the internet as well. I mean, you can Google something and depending how reliable the site is, you may or may not get the facts you want. So I think all kinds of electronic uh, interference has impacted the system. But for me, the best thing has been um, my, my change from handwriting as, as much as I love the idea to, to using a computer to create a book. What's well, a really romantic idea of the, the writing longhand, <laughs> but what's not romantic is having to ice your hands after writing 100, 120,000 words. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> But I still have fountain pens, and I still love to do all my correspondence that way. And I love I have a lineup of of colored inks of red and sapphire blue and emerald green as 
their colors or names. I, 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 I would do all my writing longhand, but it, it would cause great pain. <laughs> yes. And yes. be slower, so much slower. Well, Linda, I've had such a great time talking with you. I wish we could talk all day, uh, but uh, our time is up. We're going to send everybody to pick up their copy of Blood Oath, the 20th novel in the Alexandra Cooper series. Uh, congratulations on such an amazing uh, accomplishment and an amazing series. I'm a huge fan, uh, I, and uh, I can't wait to see what comes next. Uh, where can people find you online if they want to dig into your back catalog and, and learn more about what you do? Great. Uh, my website is www.lindafairstein.com. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive, and uh, I think it will direct you everywhere. I actually, with the help of the social media manager, who's great, I'm actually on Facebook, so you can find me there. I don't tweet. <laughs> Do a little Instagram, um, but go to the website, and I think you'll find almost everything feeding from there, including uh, the brand new pre-reviews of Blood Oath and, and hopefully links to all the, the interviews I do. Excellent. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you for such a gracious, generous, and fun, really fun interview. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Once and the goal, Hulda said. Land full of witches. Witches in the sky, in the trees, witches down the well. Justine, a great witch. Many herbs, many friends. One day, curse fall. Everyone die, everyone who believe in Hexa. This 1692. Hidden, the knowledge is. The appointed hide it. Tch. A great curse cast in Salem that year. Legion, she cast curse to kill the day world. In New Amsterdam, they not know, only see. Everyone die. What for? They blame Justine. Chased her off. She come here, I think. Hide from witch hunters. You, her blood. Possibly Hulda was correct. I was a witch, just as she was. She promised my magic would come once I was a woman. I cannot say by what steps I came to believe Hulda's seductive promises of power but I do know the moment when I chose to be a witch, irrevocably and with my whole heart. On the Sunday that Cornelia Van Cortland became Cornelia Beekman, the newly wedded pair made their first public appearance at church, their coming out, as was the custom, so that our poor congregation could thoroughly enjoy the spectacle of her bridal finery. The pair arrived late, with the whole bridal party in wedding array, Cornelia wore fawn-colored silk over a light blue damask petticoat. Gerard wore a waistcoat of the same and a long coat of white broadcloth. After services, the Beekmans graciously shared the leftovers of their wedding feast, serving chicken and ale to the congregation, outside among the graves of the old burying ground. The day was pleasant and the grass sweet. The tenant farmers and peasant wives stood all hunched about, licking their fingers and making little bows of deference. Cornelia held a bouquet of orange blossoms to her cheek, and everyone agreed that she was the most beautiful young lady in all creation, married to the most good-natured and remarkable man. That will be you some day, my mother whispered. The sun kissed Gerard's forehead as he reached into his purse and showered the graveyard with coins. All my neighbors fell to their knees at the couple's feet, scrabbling for pennies. Only I remained unbent. I stood, staring daggers into Cornelia as she accepted a surreptitious kiss from her beautiful husband. Oh, that kiss in the graveyard. A perfect kiss of love and devotion and tribute. She noticed my expression of pain and mistook it for disappointment. Did you not get a penny, dear? She said, smiling. Here you go. 
she threw her bouquet of orange blossoms to me. I caught it and gave her a tiny bow. Yes, I thought, that would be me someday. I crushed the bouquet to my heart and swore my oath. Cornelia would not win. She was no better than I. I was special, too. I wore no emeralds. I wore no silk. But I trailed fireflies. I deserved such a perfect kiss. I deserved such a perfect man. And if I could not win a god by grace, I would seize one by sorcery.